so this session is about uh, growth and innovation and it, it kind of is a mix of telling a bit of stories and what we already said publicly about what we're doing in operations in Google. So I'm not breaking any news, unfortunately, but I'm putting it all together in one presentation for you. Um, and I'm also going a little bit again into like what, how Cloud Platform can help, or like any cloud can help startups now to, to reach the scale and reach the growth which before you needed to build a huge infrastructure on because lots of this is not necessary anymore um, to reinvent the wheel. So I want to talk very quickly about big trends we see. Well, one uh, Jens took, took away earlier. Um, and then I want to talk about how we scale at Google and uh, basically then what you can do with your own company to, to make use of the scale. So one thing we know about Google is, well, we were never the best in user interface design at the very beginning, but I think we got the Google homepage pretty right. And we figured out in the end it was making complex things look simple. Everyone, nobody had a fear, and, and we realized it again and again, nobody has a fear of putting something into that search search box because it's not like, oh, I might do something wrong, did I take the right options? You just enter something and search. And it looks like what's happening there is very, very easy, while on the back, a lot of knowledge goes on. A, a, a lot of technology happens, a lot of things happen. It goes so far that when I actually was, uh, before I started at Google, I, I told, my friends about my new job and whatever that I found a job at Google I was very happy because it's it's such a great IT company to work for and one of my friends had her 14 year old sis, sister visit at that time and she said Google but it's a website why does anyone work there like <laughs> <laughs> it works already it's already running so nobody needs to work there <laughs> so I think we figured that out and, and that's something you should you should try to achieve as well. Like make your company so that simple. And I think there's a few here in Estonia which which look like very simple services, very easy to use that people don't even notice the complexity which is or was behind that beforehand. Um, another thing, you should probably. Uh, try to find this whole 10 things we know to be true article. If you search for 10 things we know to be true, you will find it. Um, this was written shortly after Google was founded. Number one is focus on the user and all else we follow. And it's probably the single most important of these 10 things. Another one is fast is better than slow, which we already mentioned. And I think if every engineer in Google like read these 10 things once a week and try to incorporate it into the work daily, things would even be faster and better at Google. So um, it just shows that this is how Google has started. We focused on the user. We wanted everything else had these, these ads all over the page and in the search engine because you needed to make money very quick. And we were like, no, 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 no. The user doesn't want that. The user doesn't want any of uh, want to be disturbed by ads. So we had the little ads on the side. A and it worked very well for Google. So in the end, if you focus on the user, and I think some of the companies I spoke to have, have that in mind here as well, everything else will work quite well. I have a question. Yes. What do you think about these binders here? <laughs> I think they're fine because they're on the side. Like it could be the other way around. It could be that like someone pops up and uh, <laughs> shows a big banner in the middle of the presentation, or like the sponsors being mentioned at the beginning doesn't really disturb anybody. So I think it's very well done. It's and everyone knows if otherwise they would have to pay an entrance fee. They wouldn't like that either. So it's still focusing on the user. <laughs> And you can probably not always make everyone happy, but most of the people. And another trend, which is what Jens already mentioned, is how quickly the world changed. And I think if you think how the mobile phone industry changed, it doesn't become much clearer than uh, looking at this picture. This was 2005. Uh, the Pope, John Paul II, died. A new Pope was elected. And this was what... Uh, 
the Vatican looked like during, during the election time in 2005. Going a few years later in 2013, this is what it looked like. So this is not really a trend anymore. It's already there. And you can go to any bus station, any airport, you will see it for yourself. So I don't even want to know mobile, want to talk about mobile anymore, but just this has been eight years. Eight years ago, nobody knew you knew used a smartphone. And uh, maybe some people had a PDA or something, but yeah, now you think the other way. And now we think about mobile only. Like, there's several big services which don't exist on the desktop, which have hundreds of millions of users. And this is kind of what we see as, as the big trends. You should be able to work with any device, anytime, anywhere, and the speed and adoption matters as well. So, so it's really, really important to stay in that way. And we're in a good spot for that, but, but we think also it was never better for a startup to be in a good spot to care about all of these as now. Like, like it's very easy for uh, small companies to uh, compare, and many big companies actually struggle with this, struggle with the speed, struggle with devices, etc. So, so you can provide real value there. Um, which comes already to the second part. I want to keep this short. So when we think about scale, we can see it where we ended up. And this is where we are now. When we launch a service, it needs to be made for a billion users, which means if we have a new service which is not so successful, it might have 5 million users, 10 million users. So even when you work on a minor project in Google, you need to make sure it scales to millions of users. And uh, on the bigger services, we see in every minute, we see 3 million searches, 1,000 new devices, and there's 100 hours of YouTube uploaded every minute at Google. So this is what it's come to, and this is the kind of data we need to work with. And we are not the only ones. Like other big, uh, other internet web companies are dealing with similar amounts. And uh, there's, I love this uh, link. I don't know if my web will be fast enough here. It shows you the internet in real time, basically how big web property is, what happens during the time you visit the site. And you can see how much money is spent at a big retailer, how much check-ins work at Foursquare, how many Facebook likes happen. And when you build your own company, you kind of have to see this as the end results. Like, you have to work that you can, at some point, use that scale and uh, make use of all these users around because you can reach them all, all over the globe instantly. Where, where do they get the data from? Um, well, they don't actually get the data which, which is happening in real time. So, it, it, yeah, it's a JavaScript. You can <laughs> read it. They look, they look at public data which was published and which is like obviously averages or peaks, and they break it down to the second and then run their own contest. It's not that it will go faster at the day and slow at night or anything like that. <laughs> but it gives you a good impression. And uh, well, we took the best part of 15 years to build that and build an infrastructure which can maintain that growth. Um, but it wasn't always like that. Everyone starts small. And this is actually um, uh, a post which was shared by Urs Hölzle, who is our um, head of infrastructure. And he posted the first bill oh, sorry. he got for, for, uh, for a data center, a Google data center, which was basically a virtual data center, which was a seven by four foot space. Um, <laughs> space enough to rack a few servers. They brought their own servers, and they got a power network connection. And you can see they got um, two megabit network connection to serve all the users going to google.com, and they got a 15 megabit internet uh, uplink connection to crawl the internet. Um, and they get at a very discounted rate because it was all incoming traffic, but the data center, they were built in, mostly had outgoing traffic, so they got a special rate for that. And uh, you can actually even see, even then Google was special uh, because there was a special order. They wanted 320 amps uh, in this VDC space, which was exceptionally much. 
much power used for the little space. Um, and this is kind of how we always try to get to the limits of the hardware or space or power or whatever we have. Um, so it's been a long way. And, but very, very soon, after starting with a few servers, we noticed hardware isn't something you can build around, you, you can, can't rely on. You can't rely on a single device never failing. Like any hard drive might only fi fail every 10 years, but once you have 100,000 of them, one will fail every hour. Failure suddenly becomes the norm. And it's the same we saw in networking, having thousands of networking devices. You don't only have the failures which, the, which, which you learned before, you have the failure which the vendor tells you, oh, this should never happen. And uh, so you, you need to work with any kind of failure cases and, and find out how to very, very quickly react and how to react in software. And this is how you can build reliability over time. Um, the network, I could talk for hours about the network so you can find me after this and do it. This is um, basically what I said before is our B4, our special backbone which we built between the data centers which is completely software defined. So we manage exactly how much data flows to a, from A to B at every time. And we had an advantage there because since we know for most of the data where it's coming from. This is the data between the data centers. There's no user data coming in and out here. We know how much data will have to be copied in what time frame, and then we can decide based on software what way to route it. If you use routers out of the box, they will always either use the short shortest path, or you can tweak around a little bit, but it doesn't take into account what you already know what will happen in the future. Or, or what will happen over the next few minutes at least. So, so that way we have much more control. This is only the major data centers. We have a huge edge network going to Africa, going to South America, going to Australia. Um, and we try to catch the user as close to where he is as possible. We try to have uh, direct connections with as many ISPs as possible to make sure that we control the, the most of the network way on the way to the service the user is using. Um, and we can control the speed because speed is very, very important for us. And our network was built for speed. Um, one other special thing is how we keep the systems up. We built on something, a term which was coined in Google is site reliability engineers. And it's something between a sysadmin and a software engineer and he needs to be excellent in both of that. Because the site reliability engineer, he gets a property, a web property, it could be Google Search, it could be Gmail, whatever, and they are responsible that this site stays up. And in one point in time, one person is basically the main responsible for this site being up. So they need to do some general assessment tasks like managing resources, etc., etc., automating this, automating the monitoring, the alerting, all of that but they also need to be able to understand the software itself. Because sometimes you have a bad release and something goes terribly wrong, still happens unfortunately, not so often luckily, and then the site reliability engineers need to re react quickly and they need to have insight into the code. And they need to be able, in the, worst, in the worst case, to work on the code as well and do very quick changes on them. Um, we also have a lot of uh, experience in building extremely redundant service, geographically redundant service, data centers across different continents, across different regions, and always staying N plus two. Not only N plus one, or not only having extra one, but having extra two uh, resource capacities. Why is that? It's so um, we can use maintenance, and this is the one thing, we constantly upgrade our data centers by using maintenance windows. So one can be in maintenance window and one can still fail and it's still no catastrophe. We can then find a strategy in that moment to either dis disturb the maintenance or whatever. So it's at least N plus two for the, for, for the normal services. And with the maintenance windows, it's actually a funny story when we launched our cloud business for years we had maintenance windows in our data centers where we said, okay, this bunch of servers goes out this week, that week, everyone moved this, uh, 
will have to know these services will be off, please move them somewhere else. And then we go through, people can take time, upgrade, network, server, software, RAM, whatever needs to be upgraded, they have a whole week. And that week is sometimes very packed. And then you bring the services back up again. When we first launched Google Compute Engine, this is kind of the same thing we did there. Um, we said, okay, we have maintenance windows, so your virtual machines, they will be down for one and a half weeks from that date. And our customers were like, what? I have a virtual machine. No, 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 but these one and a half weeks, please, another zone. But how can I migrate my data? And we very quickly realized not everybody built the systems for that redundancy and reliability how Google does. Well, actually, nearly nobody does, at least at the beginning. The very professional companies do, but many people who just tried something out, they couldn't, couldn't use that system very well. So what we now offer is we migrate the, v, the whole VM for you in, before the maintenance, so you won't even notice we do this, this maintenance. You still might have a failure case where the VM goes down and hopefully bring it up somewhere else, but this is much, much rarer than, and it's not a week and a half long usually. So, but in general, anyone should build the software that actually you could take something out for a week. If, if your service doesn't withstand that, it doesn't withstand the catastrophe either. And then we do something very special where we try to look at what catastrophic failure cases do happen. And we do like a yearly disaster recovery training exercise where we, we think of all kinds of things which might happen. An earthquake in San Francisco area might actually happen. We think of a flood in Asia might actually happen and uh, affect one of our data centers. There might be a huge power outage in Europe. There might be a zombie attack going into one of our data centers. What would we do? And we simulate all these failure cases and think of how we would, would react. First on the technical level, how could we very keep the service running, make sure extra capacity comes up, but then we go further and further. Business processes need still to run. Sometimes you need, if, if you figure out something has been more permanently taken out, let's say a fire destroys a large part of a data center, you will soon need funds to approve something. And if people are not available in one region because some human catastrophe happened as well, then you need some way to work around that. So, so this is, how we built the reliability over time. I have a question yes? So do you have special, specially trained people pretending they are zombies and they are attacking to your data centers and they try to react? <laughs> so the good thing is pe people in Google still believe what is told them over chat. So if someone says we're in the data center, we're being attacked by zombies, they don't want video proof. <laughs> they believe it. So you just run away and... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, no. uh, given all this uh, complexity and coolness, uh, how did it happen that a couple of years ago Gmail was uh, down for almost a day? <laughs> I don't know what that Gmail outage uh, for a whole day for most users. I do know about most of the major Google outages. It's, it's a human error element is most, mostly involved in those. And we try to protect as, against those as much as possible always as well. Um, but then also we try to learn from failure cases like this happen. So we go through a rigorous process afterwards where we see what exactly happened and how can we make sure this doesn't happen again. And so we try to improve our reliability over time and increase the targets. Um, yes, there were some cases where, where some things happened. In some cases we have made like a very high level understanding explanation of what happened public. Um, I don't have the very high level explanations in my head, so I can't give them to you, <laughs> but you can search for them. <laughs> but internally, it's a lot more going on, and, and we make sure that we actually address as much as possible the root of the problem and not the last step which brought the system to, to break. And, and, yeah. Question about the maintenance part. So you told that you bring the other some servers down, how much is there a human involved, or is there a, like scripts that someone clicks that strip, scripts start running and it takes down the servers and updates everything? So, there, there is some human interaction involved in that. 
um, obviously because we change schedules and, and we did, did, sometimes we say, okay, we have a little bit of a resource issue there, do we rethink really that? But generally, every team should automate their own way of moving these services in some way. So basically, there's a published schedule where we say, okay, this will happen here, and then all the teams which have resources there will go and will move. So the people have to be... The people have to, to know what their, service, what their service can sustain or not. Some people might say, oh, we are N plus three. If one is out, we're still N plus two. We don't care if this is out one and a half weeks. Some people might say, oh, we, might actually, we have actually t to get some temporary resources somewhere else and whatever, and we have processes for that. What I, what I meant is, like, is there some person who fixed some command on that time? There's always some human interaction involved. In, like, once, but the person who actually brings down the thing, it's, it's actually one person who then says, basically cuts off network capacity from that uh, bunch of servers. And in that moment, you, if the other teams didn't take any precautions, the service wouldn't run anymore. Luckily, this doesn't happen because this is such a common thing, so you can't ever launch a service without planning for this case. So, so if you want to make some extra applications, for example, you always have to prepare for the server. Well, it depends. We have like different frameworks, and the idea is that at some point you shouldn't have. You, you just use a framework which already cares for it, and someone else cares for it for you. And if you want to build a small application, you should be able to do that very fast, and it should still withstand this. And this is where we also merge kind of our external and internal efforts that people can deploy similar to how we do externally on the cloud platform. You can run your application on App Engine. You don't have to care about which data center it currently runs in, uh, in the region or whatever, because it's fully managed for you. And internally, you have similar frameworks to build applications that you don't have to care about the details, and you don't even have to care about where it runs exactly in, in any given point in time. But someone in Google does. <laughs> so this is the short explanation. Um, so this is. Um, this, so this is just another example of, of how we use software. Um, this is the, the Google Data Store um, based on a technology we call Bigtable. I don't actually know why this slide is exactly here in the presentation anymore. Um, it, it just shows how we, in the software side, also prepare for outages because what's special about Data Store is it's highly replicated and you have multiple you have multiple copies, so anyone but the team working on Bigtable doesn't, uh, doesn't care. You just push your data into Bigtable. It's actually the question you asked, more or less. And you don't care where it runs. So, so the Google engineers can make use of these services someone built for them already. But the Bigtable engineers, they need to know how much capacity do they have where right now and where might be a maintenance coming up and where might be a catastrophe in this moment. And so someone manages something, but it doesn't need to be you who only wants to run a piece of software. Um, this is some things which are more universal. It's not unique to Google. Um, and it's basic processes we follow at Google. I think most bigger startups follow as well. Most smaller startups know they should follow them. Um, many enterprises don't follow them, um, should also follow them. And, and it's just things we learn. It's, it helps much to build for scale. Launch and iterate, we already talked about it. Uh, collect data, do experiments, run it. Don't try to have a perfect product. Another thing we don't, didn't talk about is in, internationalization. Even when you're pretty small, try to work with at least two languages, because you can easily go from two to five to 10 languages. But if you build your software statically, that some strings are hidden somewhere, and you want to go from one to two uh, languages, it gets a pain. Actually, from two to five might still be a pain once you go to a different script, or suddenly the, the script goes from right to left. And, it's still not that easy, but you should think of it as early as possible and use any frameworks which are of help to you for that. Um, the next one is actually the example from the picture. Be aware of details and make your system fixable. 
So this might just look like we painted some pipes in the data center just to be fun Google colors, but it actually shows some kind of the water flow and it shows um, where the water is coming from and if it's hot water or cold water because it's for the cooling system for our data center. Um, so if there's actually a problem with the cooling, the facility engineers can very quickly identify where the problem might be and take restorative actions. And that's the same way if you obviously properly document your code, um, if you keep it modular, all things everyone wants to do, um, and, but the real software engineer sometimes misses why to do this. But it can save you so much space. Also, test early and often, like run experiments, we had this again, do A-B testing. There's a lot of people who say, oh, I know, I've done this 10 million times, this way it will work. If anyone disagrees, just do an A-B test. If, even if nobody disagrees, but someone has an idea, do an A-B test. Um, as soon as you have some live users, test what works with them. Do, do user interface studies, do A-B testing, uh, and that way, try to iterate your product very often and release often. Like, uh, we run multiple experiments in parallel all the time, and we also release basically all the time different updates for our products. We don't have ver Gmail version 1, Gmail version 1.1, Gmail version 1.2. In some products, it might be better to have a release cycle like Chrome, where we have this 12-week release cycle with new features coming out. But, but this is more to keep the teams in pace. So it, it depends a little bit on your product, but try at least not to be slow. And the other thing is, think of the maximum users you can get. Like, do you have a product where when everybody, well, if you want to manage, let's say, all the gyms in Tallinn, how many users will actually use that fitness management system maximum? You can probably be okay with two servers and a simple database on the same servers or whatever. But if you want to build something which a anyone in the globe can use, like you want to build the next Snapchat or whatever, you should build that you don't have to refactor once you go from 10,000 users to 100,000 to 1 million to 10 million. Um, you need to think of more than one scale. And it's not that hard anymore. You can use lots of systems other people built for you. You can use scalable databases which can scale to millions of users. They don't, they're not complex, much more complex to set up than what you might already know. Uh, you can use storage systems in the cloud where the whole storage is managed for you, so you don't have to think about the details. Yeah, you had a question? Um, firstly, what means A-B testing? So A-B testing means you have a website, it's already running, someone says, what if this blue button were red? Um, let's say on, on your website, on your, the try it now button at the beginning. What if it's not blue, what if it's red? So you run an experiment where you suddenly show 10% of the users a red button instead of a blue button, and then you measure how many people react to the red button and how many people react to the blue button. And then suddenly you have an answer, you know what's better. Do you have automated tests and on what levels? Like so, we don't have automated testing for most products to the levels that it actually suggests what we could change. But once we say what we want to change, it's very easy to set it up for us, different experiments. So you can say, I want to test these 10 different colors to 1% of users each for this part of the UI um, now for the next one day or whatever. And, and it will make sure every user only gets to one side each because it uh, checks on the cookie. Or okay. As I understand, this A-B testing is more like testing user reaction. To exactly. Survey. But uh, I was asking uh, um, how much you have those like automated tests, for example, okay. those user scenarios where some input fields are uh, input fields are like uh, some data is written into them okay. the computer and then submit button is pressed and so forth. So How thorough are, are you on that? Very thorough in general. You can't check in any piece of code in Google without having a test for the same part of code. So that's the first part. So, so any line of code, we should have 100% coverage. Anything should be tested that it 
brings the expected results. Now this is still not enough because some people have, uh, you can write your tests, they still work, but it, you, there's some case you don't think of and there it doesn't work. Then we have extra software engineers in tests which write tests over specific software where they might not know the details on how they are written. Then we have security engineers who check for security vulnerabilities in all this software using automated framework, but also using code reviews, also using all this kind. So we, tr we generally have a very high code quality coming into production in that case already. But we still need to very quickly uh, react to anything which might be missed and might not be exactly the way which is expected. You mean, did you mean like, do we simulate users? Yeah, a good, a good answer. Yeah. So, but but exactly the way you say that we simulate exactly how a user works for some user interface tracing products, we do this as well. For backend products, usually you don't need it that much, but basically in a browser product, etc., we have like automated tests on how users might actually click and move over and whatever and and what do. What framework you prefer? Do I don't know what framework these guys are using. I believe they were largely written their own as well. Um, but we do also use some out-of-the-box things there. But I don't know how they run these tests. I just know that they happen and that they, they actually happen quite thoroughly and quite often, like over-the-top X websites. And do you have any idea, like, uh, picking percent? What percent do you make your own software and how much you use already like open source things? I have that aren't yours. Which Booker is one of them perhaps then. I don't have an idea in percent what it is. We generally have written a lot ourselves and we use little open source software, but we do use open source software. Um, generally it's easier internally as a software engineer to use Google-owned product because you don't have to care about the licensing because it's owned by Google. Even open source software, you have to make sure you fulfill all the licensing restrictions. Um, so there's a list of libraries we can use, we can't use, etc. Um, in general, we write a lot of software on our own because of the whole software innovations coming out of Google as well. All right. So I think I covered this slide. So the next thing we say is basically when you build software, you should avoid snowflakes. There should be nothing done, done like, oh, let me quickly log into that server and fix that bug here. Um, this is not the way, we be, because that way you create a snowflake. You create one server which has been manually touched. You can't really, you didn't really in that moment know what you did and cannot get that server back in exactly that state. So we try to build our infrastructure in a way that everything is managed in a reproducible way. Every deployment should be reproducible. Everything should be written in a declarative way, which means you say, okay, I want three servers here. Um, you bring up the standard image, you install that software, you, you then run that script and then this one health check it and it's ready for production. This is declarative management. And that way you can reproducible deployment, uh, deploy it. And if you find a bug, you, you basically bring up a new machine it, while you change that template where you say how you bring it up. Maybe you run a slightly different script. And then you bring up a new machine, you throw away the old machine. It's not like you work on the machine which is already um, brought up. So that way you can make sure that once this server dies, maybe this hard drive dies or CPU dies, you can bring it up again the same way. Um, that also makes it easier to run your own dev test environment, your own staging environment, etc., which ex ac actually mirrors what you run in production because you don't play around with production. And it also, also part of this is an automated build, test and deploy cycle. Um, Whenever you write new code, first it goes through peer review, then it gets built, then it gets tested by the unit test, and only when this, all of this is good, it can get deployed. First in staging, then in production, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and this is what many of the mid-sized startups are building now, and 
everyone kind of uses different frameworks for this. Uh, there's a lot of good frameworks around, for example, Jenkins for continuous uh, integration, etc. But everyone likes to do it a little bit differently. And, uh, but the idea is that you all do it and you, that you don't leave out any steps. And uh, this is very, very important. And then one thing which we see as a big thing, and we already saw as a big thing, is containers. So everything at Google runs in, in, in containers. Now, I don't know who knows the idea of what a co container is. It's basically... We have a logistics company with that information. Ah, <laughs> exactly. And it has the same idea in, in Unix. A Linux container is uh, basically based on the thing that, that you put something in a defined space and you can run very easily stack it. Basically, you can run several of these containers on one machine, and they all run in their own environment. Inside the container, you don't care about what's going on outside. It's always the same from the inside. So it's basically you have a Linux environment in itself, but they sh all share the same physical resources. It's but it's different from a VM because uh, you have some resource isolation. You cannot see what the other container is doing. But you, you share, for example, the Linux kernel, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you can even share some of the, some of the physical resources. You can oversubscribe. Um, but, but you can provide accounting for the resources, et cetera. So everything we do at Google, every software we write, runs in a container. And they only con uh, you write software which runs in a container. And you only communicate through other services through between the containers, um, not through writing something into a file which someone else reads, but through a call between these containers. And uh, that basically allows as well to make these, these systems very modular, that you can bring one version up, the next one down, so they don't really affect each other. And uh, to, to bring this very much further, it's over two billion containers we start per week. Because we also manage our, our resources that way, how much capacity we need for every service at, at which way. And, and this is done through our Omega management system um, internally or Borg as it was before. And this is, this is how we use it. Um, and basically, um, yeah, that comes in the next part, how you can do all this yourself. Because containers wasn't a big thing. Um, wasn't very, very easy to use until very, very recently. Okay, so I have about 10, 15 more minutes, so I want to very quickly go into how you can use Google, <laughs> Google Cloud services to, to basically build similar ways than we build systems um, as easy as possible, obviously. Like, obviously you can go build by machines, do everything yourself, but it's not really practical unless you have huge funding and uh, plan to become uh, I don't know, like a company of uh, 50,000 people, et cetera, et cetera, then this might still make sense. So for, for most startups these days, it, it might make sense to use some kind of cloud services because you actually I immediately have access to the scale which is given. So you can bring up new services in seconds or less than a minute, and you can scale up to a million users without basically planning for it, like you can do it next week. Um, you also have already predefined SLAs. You don't need to care about, oh, I bought the wrong hard drives, they're not very reliable, etc. cetera. Um, and you have the lucky thing of zero plant maintenance in, in the services, like you don't have to care about uh, the service running away. Um, the service runs you, so you have all this we talked about, what. Soft, Google software engineers sometimes have to care about, sometimes when they use an internal service they don't have to care about. Um, and you can do all of this immediately geographically redundant. When Google started, we only had one data center. Um, you already have access to many of them. And uh, so you can hopefully, the other thing we want to we work on a lot is integrating into tools people know. So we want to integrate a lot into open source software people use. Um, support third-party tools and libraries people use, so, so it's not very difficult to start. Um, 
And all of that should help you decrease your time to market. So you, it should be very, very easy to launch an app. And whenever I see startups, I know it's already working that way. Like um, when I see now how quickly from a technical side the startups get started, even three, four, five years back, I think it was much more difficult to come up with a complex system. It's like, okay, I need to hire a developer. He first needs to sit there for four, five, six months until I even have the first prototype. Now he gives you a prototype in a few days or a few, like two, three weeks, depending on how complex your product is. And then you can iterate on that, make that prototype a reality and, and bring it to something. Um, and also basically when you start a new company, you want to really focus on, depending on what you want to focus on, like, Maybe you want to run your own infrastructure, maybe you really like to do it, but if the important thing for you is the software, then you, you really want to move towards what infrastructure as a service where you run your own virtual machines or platform as a service where actually someone takes care of the application server for you, of the operating system updates, and you, you just deploy your code and the application runs. Now, what does the Google Cloud Platform have to do here and what even is the Google Cloud Platform? After one and a half hours, we still didn't talk about that. Um, <laughs> so Google Cloud Platform is everything at Google targeted at developers to build your services on Google infrastructure. So everything infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. And we try to put it into three brackets, computing, storage, and app services. So. On the computing side, we have Compute Engine, which you run your machines, you can run your Hadoop cluster, you can run everything, uh, anything you want, any kind of software. Um, App Engine is our platform as a service, which we want to make as easy for developers as possible to run your code and run a scalable application which can scale to millions of users. And for that, backing that up, we have different storage options. Cloud storage can save petabytes of image, video data, anything you want, um, SQL databases, NoSQL database based on that big table I talked about. And on app services side, we have uh, Google BigQuery, which I talked about in the previous talk. And then Cloud Endpoints is something we use, um, which is kind of a backend as a service, so you can, you can uh, attach it to App Engine and it allows you to, to very quickly um, um, open up a RESTful API which all mobile clients can talk to very easily. We even automatically generate client libraries so your, your mobile and web clients can, without caring about communication between client and server in a secure way, with authentication, with uh, serializing your JSON, without any injection attacks and whatever, uh, we take care of all of that and you just do a method call and you get a result from the server and, and can work with that. Um, what this can bring a small team like these four people to um, is uh, they build Snapchat. Over Snapchat now, 750 million photos are exchanged a day. I don't know he, who here uses Snapchat. It's mostly used by people in their teens and 20s. Um, but it's quickly gaining users even older. <laughs> the 20. You're not in your 20s? I'm not in my 20s anymore. Yes. I, <laughs> so, anyway, um, currently they have a, a, well, a two digit number of employees. Last number I heard was 30, maybe now it's 40, 50, 60, I don't know. Um, and, but, Basically, they, run a, they turned down a $3 billion offer from Facebook based on a service they, they built on Google App Engine. At that point, when they had the $3 billion service, they didn't have a single full-time person running backend server infrastructure stuff at all. They only had people coding, they had maybe one marketing person, etc., and that was it. So, so this is the scale that it basically allows these days. Um, another example which I find it's a bit more realistic because it's not the, the extreme example. It's, um, it's a company called Fresh Planet. It's a game studio in the US. Um, and what they have, they're like a small game studio, you have like 40, 50 employees, and they build small pods of five, six, seven people who build the next game. 
and bring it online. And some of them are very successful, some of them are mildly successful. The first really successful game was Song Pop. Um, and this just shows how they scaled. They scaled to 100,000 daily active users after a few months. Then they thought, okay, this app engine we're using, maybe we should have some support for that. And uh, they opened a the premier account where they can <laughs> open support tickets. Um, at 500,000 daily active users, and this is quite typical, this was a few months later, they were like, hmm, actually this app engine starts costing us some money, um, which is, we can afford it, but it, it's, it's money. Um, so they started to work on optimizing their code to save a little bit on the money, which actually they started looking at the traces, what consumes the most resources. Um, which improved at the one time the, the end user experience and their, their cost as well. And after a year, they did some more optimizations for cost reasons when they were at a million daily active users. And they peaked at uh, 2,400 daily active users in December last year and were serving 17 terabytes a day from Google Cloud Storage. And up and then just grew with it. They didn't have to refactor that much their code. They were um, they're using App Engine for several of their games, um, but only had one engineer working full time on the backend stuff for all the games combined. So um, that shows how you basically can 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 scale that. You don't see the the part which is unfortunately part of the game for especially for games. They're quite short lived, so the the number of daily active users goes down a little bit again. Um, but at the same point, the resource consumption and their bill goes down the same way as well. Sorry, I could pause for a moment. What exactly is App Engine? So App Engine is uh, the platform as a service, and I go a little bit more into details. But what you basically do is you write your application in Java, in Python, in PHP, or in Go. So one of our supported languages, and I go into more when we might support more languages. And then you push it, and it gets deployed on our servers. But we care about how many servers capacity you need. We just tell you, uh, we just say, OK, we see this many requests coming in. The server is getting overloaded. We bring up a new instance. So you don't have to care about how much resources you need. It's done fully automatically. What exactly I do with that engine? Does it store my thought or some kind of? Yes. So, it, so, so exactly. For example, here it takes the requests from users. It connects them to each other on on the server backend, because Songpop it's a game where people play against each other. So you, you say, okay, I want to play a game with my friend. I want to choose this category. It gets sent to the server. The server sends this guy a notification, the other guy comes back, say, okay, I'm ready to play round one. It serves you the questions from the database of questions, which is stored on the server. Basically, it's the cloud backend for this mobile application. It was made for web applications, but actually, it's also very, very useful for mobile applications. And, well, this is kind of what we saw, and I said we have a platform as a service, we have infrastructure as a service, so either you can run your own service, or as I said, you use one of our supported languages and we do everything for you. It was kind of this choice, and with other cloud companies it's the same kind of choice. Either you do everything yourself, you update your, your Linux uh, when there's a new security patch out, if you forget, you have a bad time, or um, you do something where well, you don't need to care about all this stuff, but you have to basically run within the guidelines of this framework. You cannot use your favorite library, maybe, because it's not supported, or your favorite language. And so you had either the full flexibility or the total managed service. And, and this was kind of binary choice, and we don't want it to be that way. We say you should have managed services, but still be open and flexible and use whatever tools you like to use. And use uh, and be productive in the way you want to be, and and that's where what the end goal is that that you can have whatever you want. And our first step there is something we call managed VMs. Um, basically, runs on the App Engine framework. So you still deploy your code in the App Engine. We push your code to servers, but now these code will run on a VM which we create for you based on what you say you, 
you will need. You say you want two core VMs, we give you two core VMs. You say you want high memory VMs, we give you high memory VMs. So, and on these virtual machines, you have full access. Um, if you want to make any changes, if you want to install any libraries, if you want to put some temporary data on the file system, you can do all that. But we still manage how your code is put into the application server. And we take care of image updates, security patches of these machines as well. You still, what you still have to think, it's not that you manage everything, so you still have to somehow work within the guidelines, because we say, well, we manage this machine, we might bring it down every time, we bring another one up, because we manage also the load balancing to the machines, so don't store any data on the machine which you can't lose. Store your data in some database somewhere, or get the, the media files from cloud storage, or something like that, and, and we will manage your application server and the number you need, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, you, you're not limited anymore to, oh, you can't install this library because it's not supported by App Engine. Now you can install any software you can install in your machine. And we're going further. You can even, with the, with the newest version we're currently testing, you can use any runtime you want. So traditionally, we support four languages. Now you can say, okay, I want to run Node.js on a VM on Compute Engine. I know how a Node.js application server is set up, so I provide a template for this, or someone else does. Maybe not, maybe Google, maybe someone else, maybe you, you yourself, and you deploy your code within that, and we still health check your server. We see it responds to HTTP requests. We see, um, we provide some basic services to it. You have some, like, memcache service you can use. You have a scalable database, etc., and we provide the security patches and operating system updates. So this is kind of the first step where we want to provide the best of both worlds. Um, there's another tool which is closer to the virtual machine side, if you maybe want to create a scalable database yourself, where you build a template where you say, what do you want to have in a bunch of machines, how do you set them up, and the replica pool service creates and destroys a bunch of VMs, health checks them, and adds a load balance on top of that. But it doesn't provide the, the, the application server where you put in your code. And both of these are currently in testing. Um, same with Deployment Manager, where you put this basically in, in, in a template file, where you add um, more information about what kind of firewalls you have, what kind of network you have, what kinds of disks you use, if you want to use an autoscaler service, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is what I talked about with declarative management. You say exactly what you want to have, we give it to you, um, you don't, and you just care that it's there. And, and we also, it should be self-healing. And that's, that's the idea that we want to offer a continuum of compute, a compute as a spectrum, as we call it, where you say, how much control do I want to have if I want to run really weird software which needs a lot of computing power and need the last millisecond of, uh, of latency, maybe I want to still do everything myself on Compute Engine, um, maybe I don't want to do anything myself, but you can have some things in the middle now, and you can mix and match between them, and you can also break out of them and say, okay, now I want to have more flexibility myself. Is already so, available? So, well, Managed VMs Replica Pools is currently in limited preview, which means uh, you can sign up to be a tester, and if there's capacity, they will give you access. The documentation is, is public, so you can already see in, if it's useful for you um, at the moment. However, limited preview, means we might make changes, um, not in our normal time of we will give you six months notice or whatever, we might make changes in two weeks, three weeks, one month. How do you call this service? Which one? Is it this one? Is it part of uh, Google App Engine or something else? So that's the thing. At the moment we have App Engine and Compute Engine and the services run kind of in between them. Um, so that's why we give them all their own names. But basically, they all manage together now in, in Google as one compute unit, um, which, which tries to make the switch between all of those as, as simple and as easy as possible. But for now, we still have the two names, App Engine and Compute Engine. 
and replica pools is something on top of compute engine which makes it easier to manage compute engine and managed VMs is something which makes up engine more flexible and that's where they kind of come together. So it, it's a mix between the two traditionally but we might eventually at some time the name might change or whatever so this is not set in stone while it's, while it's in limited preview. Um, Another thing I talked about is containers, and uh, it, well, I talked about we have been using containers for years. We do two billion a week. Um, Docker is a framework which became hugely popular over the last year. Um, very new. I think just in June they said that they're now out of beta, and you, you should be very fine using it in production. Uh, it makes the the process of creating Linux containers and deploying Linux c containers much, much easier to use Docker. And we think this is a great framework, so we want to make support for it much, much easier as well. And we took a few steps um, to, to do it a, a, across our products, which are merging together anyway. Um, so on Compute Engine, we support something called CoreOS, which is a container-optimized version of Linux. Um, and, and you can use that to run Docker containers very easily on Google Compute Engine. We also have Kubernetes, which someone asked, you asked, I think, the question about earlier, or someone did, you people moved around. Uh, and I will talk about that on the next slide. On Up Engine, what we allow now is, where I said in the managed VM, you can plug in your own, your own runtime. You can now, instead of your own runtime, plug in a doc Docker container, and we will run that Docker container for you on up engine and we'll get the requests. So this makes it even more flexible for you to run your own system on top of up engine, but, uh, but with some kind of management involved from our side and in a managed VM. Um, now, what is Kubernetes this guy is asking about? Um, it's a Greek work for pilot, but it's also our open source effort for a cluster manager from Google. So what Docker gives you is a very easy way to deploy uh, Docker images and to bring up containers on your Linux machines. What it doesn't help you is it doesn't tell you um, where to bring which container and how much resources do you have anywhere over all your data centers and whatever. Um, so this is what a cluster manager is doing, and that's what we've been doing internally a lot. And with Omega, we brought out the new framework internally last year. And this is our first step at an open source software. We brought it out, um, I think in June we announced it, and we published the first source code. And very quickly had the first people joining uh, the ship, <laughs> very interestingly. Um, so. Uh, Microsoft joined, Red Hat joined, now we just announced VMware joined as well, and they all support Kubernetes, so it runs on their infrastructure as well. We built it, so it runs on Google Compute Engine, but we built it openly, so you can easily plug in. And very quickly, these other companies noticed this is a very nice framework, for mem or, the, or a very interesting framework to managing uh, the, the clusters, and yes, you should manage our infrastructure, you should be able to manage our infrastructure with that as well, or Docker containers on our infrastructure with that as well. So what does it do? Yeah? Good question. So right now Kubernetes is very easy to, uh, to run on a cloud engine. Yes. And if you want to run it on your set of, for example, Debian servers, it's a little more complicated. Do you plan to also to simplify this scenario? So I don't know the exact plans. Um, we want as much as possible to the op for the open source community to contribute to this. The question is, what do we do when some don't contribute? Will we write plugins ourselves? Will someone from the community do this? Um, the idea is it should run anywhere, and it should be quite easy anywhere. And I think with CoreOS, it's already much easier to run it on your own machines. Um, I expect the, the major Linux distribution to follow suit very quickly because there's such a huge movement around Kubernetes already. I think we were a bit surprised because the first version was just brought out in June, how much effort has already gone in there. And it just shows this was kind of the missing, missing thing past Docker to bring it up. 
Um, now you could say, okay, it's a simple thing. It just tells you, okay, I have 10 machines. Hmm, I have these, these, these kind of services I want to deploy. Just put them somewhere and they're very easy to do, very simple to do. Kubernetes is a bit more than that. Um, it manages resources in pods. A pod is something, could be several Docker images which run together, but they usually should run on one machine. So maybe several developers wrote several modules of code, each runs in their own Docker container, as we said, uh, everything should communicate each other outside of these containers to keep it modular, but basically you want to keep them in one machine so they can communicate uh, without a network call between each other, or be without the network latency between each other. Um, and that is basically what would we call a pod. So pod could be a front-end server, pod could be back-end server, and then you have the resources where you say, I have so much RAM, I have so much CPU, I want to I, I wanna, uh, divide it to these places. And then what you say, okay, once you have them uh, deployed, it also health checks them as well. So if one of the machines dies, it will have to find places for the for the containers which were on this machine to deploy them on other machines as well. And that was Kubernetes as a master and a schedule is about. And it provides some, some more data. It, it has plugin for monitoring, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It has huge functions. <laughs> Um, but it's an open source project, it's under rapid development, as I said, first version was launched in June, um, and there's basically code coming out at least every week, added to it, plugins, etc. So it's something you should definitely watch. Um, this could be the same as we had already, um, so if, in case you didn't contact me yet, <laughs> you can still contact me, you can still look at these. Um, and yeah, that's the end of my presentation, and uh, thank you, and um, any more questions? Yes? Uh, which, uh, which one do you think is better for a startup, and why? Is it Google Cloud, or maybe Amazon Cloud, or maybe <laughs> <laughs> I think for startups, Google Cloud is the best. <laughs> well, I saw. <laughs> well, um, I think it's it's very good because we we really think about the developer these days. And if you see what's happened in the last few months, you have to. I took the slide out. You have to see, Computer Engine, for example, was only launched out of beta in December. And when you see what has moved in there and in which direction, it's very much focused on the developer. And it's something we listen to. We want to provide affordable services, open source, and all of that. Um, so I think this is this is a great thing. And then on the performance side, uh, especially if you use things like Hadoop, it's something we've proven we work very, very well with, and, and you can try it out. So actually, let me, let me tell you the answer a little bit different way. I encourage you to try out all the providers and choose the best one for your platform. There's some services which Google Cloud Platform doesn't have, which some others has, and if this is a perfect fit for what you need, and it works performant, and it works reliable, etc. Then use that. Um, but I encourage you to use to try them all out and choose the best one for you. But but the worst would be if you don't try out a specific one. <laughs> and you can get a lot of credit if you're a qualifying starter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you also mentioned Corey, and you mentioned Kubernetes. Uh, yeah. Can you it's also a young product, same as Docker. Its first stable version was only last month or two months ago. So why are you so excited about it? Well, I would say core OS, we are all, we're excited about in conjunction with containers. But it's actually something which is managed by them. So they provide builds for Google Compute Engine. Um, we put them as an option for you. You don't need to use them, you can use them. But we realized even at the stage where they are, it's if someone never worked with a Docker container, it's maybe the simplest way to start using those. Um, I know many people use Docker on other OSs and, and it works quite well as well. Um, so the choice should be for the user to which one to use. So if you are going to write your product, will you be willing to take a risk to put CoreOS into production? Um, I wouldn't right now because they don't recommend doing it basically. Um, it depends a little bit on what part of your service. 
so if you have your front end and if you have your managed database already on some kind of managed service and it's only missing some some part which is maybe only uh, accessed by your employees or so whatever and it's something which is not 100% uh, necessary, maybe I would do it just because I find it exciting. But if it's something where you work with the financial branch and the reliability is from day one, maybe I wouldn't use it. So, so it depends on the use case. In general, I'm someone who says, okay, unless someone says it's for production, I will not use it for production. Yeah. What's the next for Google? Why uh, you are making all this stuff available? Um, that's a good question. It, it depends a bit. Different teams have different different goals. Um, I mean, from the business perspective, it's very good to think that the cloud platform could be a huge business opportunity because people need infrastructure resources. There's a need for that. The better they can manage them, the the, the more complex products they can build, which need, in the end, although you manage your resources effectively, need more resources. So that would be like the business point of view. From other areas, they just want to grow the internet ecosystem. Internet ecosystem growing means good for Google because uh, maybe more advertising going around, maybe more these services being used. So it, it, it's a mix of stuff, which is good for Google in that case. And then a lot of the engineers just think it's cool stuff and they, they profited a lot of open source technology, they want to use open source technology, give back to open source technology. And this is also something which nobody high up is really against, that you, you give back something to open source. And if nobody else, if it's not really a competitive advantage, like we know the other big web companies use containers as well, they build their own frameworks, whatever. So really why shouldn't smaller and medium-sized companies be also you able to use this and have a better framework for that. If it's not profitable in the next couple of years, uh, is it possible that it will be shut down like some other Google services? <laughs> <laughs> like, like some... What do you mean? Like some RSS? Yeah, yeah. for example. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, there's no 100% guarantee that it will not, but um, it's a clear, like, so for us, it's like, um, as I tried to say, like, in, in the beginning, for us, it's like, probably, like, after advertising, the second biggest business opportunity, if you look at the market five to 10 years out, um, and we're already a $50 billion company, and we probably need to go to 100 billion in the next couple of years to, like, keep the share price up and make everybody happy that it's, like, owning Google shares. Um, probably also to keep learning and certainly happy. Um, so we need to find different different areas as well. This is a very big one to that. Um, because there's a huge market, it's not something that we will forgive like easy. And then there's also a huge shift. Um, like what, what we're externalizing, it's not a product that we've built for like selling to the market. It's externalizing what we use internally and like tuning it so external people can kind of use it. Because some stuff is rough around the edges for internal engineers. Um, so we're fine tuning it a little bit so external developers can use it. Um, but it's not if you've built, let's say, a couple of data centers and put some servers in there and put some virtualization on top of that and they'll say, come to us and buy some virtual machines because we have some capacity built and you can use it. Um, it's that we do at Google anyhow. And if we can still make a business with stuff we do and we know how to do it, um, it's, it's a good stuff. It's a good, good thing for us to do. Um, we will not shut it down because if we would shut it down completely, we would shut down Google. Uh, and, the and, I mean, and about the externalization, it also goes the other way. Um, once we support like the open source products better and make it easier for developers to use what they know, it gets much easier for us to get developers in to, to shorten the cycles until they, they release their first project and to maybe make use of some of the innovations now happening from outside more. While we said a lot came from the inside to the outside in the past, now we see a lot happening in the outside as well. It doesn't mean we, we, we lost track. We're still doing some very innovative things, but also there's some things we can use there, and, and it's, it's not so disjunct anymore as it was maybe five years ago, that, that people outside are doing something completely different than, than people inside Google. And I think like, the biggest change like what's 
to understand why we do this and why this is why we're not externalizing it and why there's like also like senior management buying that it's a good thing to do is that if you look at the market and what external developers do, like there has been a I would say a big switch on how people develop software externally from because we see a lot of companies that are now younger and and using more of the type of technologies that we as a web native company would use, which is completely different from what you would have had ten years ago where most of the developers would use traditional software, traditional development methods to build stuff, and this is changing. There's a lot of young companies coming up that are growing really, really big. Um, usually if I do a more business presentation, I, sh I show a slide about like, if you look at the S&P 500, like Standard & Poor's 500 index, like I think like 30, 40 years ago, like the average age of a company being part of the S&P 500 was like 100 years, 120 years. A company now, joining. Or a company joining. Yeah. And now it's down to like 15 years. So like the company joining the S&P 500 being one of the most valuable 500 companies, kind of like from a cost perspective, is 15 years. So there's more younger companies coming in and that they work completely differently from an IT perspective, um, which makes this stuff more, more, let's say, more attractive to external companies. If you would have tried to sell containers to the external market 10 years ago, um, probably not a huge one. Um, probably not a lot of requests for this and probably we would have shut it down quickly, <laughs> as an external network. We would have still used it internally and worked on it internally because we think it's a good thing to do and it's very very successful um, and very, very efficient for us, but we probably would have not wasted time on marketing it strong. But these times are changing and we see a lot of stuff changing. Um, the thing that I tried to, like, like because we had, we had uh, the meeting with uh, the startup wise guys today and all the, their, their portfolio companies, what I tried to tell people is that thing is that stuff is changing so quickly and there's so many chances right now. It's probably the best time to start a new business and try to disrupt business models than it has ever been before. Because the barriers of entry for most industries are so low now um, that everybody with a good idea and the right level of execution can really change business models in, in those markets. And it's not just like advertising like we did and the digital like the media industry is coming up in, in all different areas. I mean, well, you could have to like, there's stuff in, in logistics as well. You know, like, I mean, for, I don't know for you here, but like in Germany and in Central Europe, also in, 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 in the US, there's like companies like Uber that like do like people transportation, like they revolutionize, like how they do this. And already people start about thinking, well, they could also do like daily deliveries. I mean, like if you have cars going around all the time, why are you not delivering stuff? Um, and like, there's possibilities for every of those industries. And you look at like what we did with Nest, like home automation. I would say a very traditional industry, how you use thermostats and stuff in your home. Um, and well, we didn't pay that much money for them. We would not think this is something that will be revolutionized over the next ten years. And look at cars. Look at Tesla with electric cars. Like um, me talking to the German car OEMs, um, how to do it? I have to be like politically correct and diplomatic on that. But like, um, I think everybody is surprised there how quickly they call out, like that people are willing to spend a hundred thousand euros for an electric car. They would have not thought a few years ago. Like everybody thought, if you have an S plus Mercedes or a seven series BMW, like this is like what people would spend a hundred thousand bucks for. People are changing their habits, and I mean, Tesla is a startup. Even if Elon Musk has a lot of money to build it, and probably none of you has. Well, <laughs> I don't know if I'm wrong, but probably none of you has that much money. But nobody would have thought that, at least in traditional Germany, that a startup from the States that tries to build a car can be a real danger for traditional car companies, how they build cars, for the next 10 to 15, 20 years now. If they are not switching from com combustion engines to something new, they will have a real, a real, um, a real problem 20, 30 years now. I'm, I'm very convinced. And I mean, and they are they are moving very quickly in the direction. I mean, what you've seen coming out from Daimler, from BMW with electric cars. Without Tesla, I I'm I'm personally convinced. It's my personal conviction that we would have not seen something like this uh, probably in this or the next decade. Who's like, why should they? There is no pressure from the market. I would have not asked for an electric car, to be honest. I would have been happy driving my BMW. So we actually did ask. 
I mean, this is happening in a lot of industries. And because this is going on, there is a huge opportunity for new technologies and a new way of doing business and a new way of building business. And um, we want to make sure that we are in the center of this and that we A, support this, um, and B, also make good business out of it. So we're not just doing it for a charity. Yes? Uh, can you give us a peek to the future? What could be plans? Like, what are your intentions in the future? As <laughs> you said, you are at the moment a $50 billion company and you tend to go to $100 billion. And I think when you started, they wanted to sell it to Yahoo for $1 million. I might be mistaken, but for $1 million. And, and Yahoo offered 100,000, they didn't take the offer, and now you've got like 50 billion. And, and what's the future? Like self driving cars? And will you own the people on the planet third? <laughs> well, we'll, we'll see, but like, I don't know. Like, the good thing is you go to your favorite search engine and you Google Skynet, and where you will see like the future, what will it will look like. Uh, no, I mean, to be honest, I have no idea like what world we'll go to. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we do in Google X, which is the, the, like the, what we call moonshot projects that we do, like glass, like the, the contact lenses, like self-driving cars, like the drones and all that stuff. Um, this is just stuff, I mean, this is stuff we do because we think it's, it's doable and it solves some real big problems and we think we can help with technology. If this will ever become a business model, we, we have no idea. It might be a good business model, it might not be a good business model um, for those technical solutions. Um, Luckily, we're in a place where we can afford to do this, and we luckily have people at the top of the company that believe in, in this kind of things. Um, so those people get the money to try that stuff. Um, some of them will probably become a big business, and some probably won't. For the foreseeable future, I think we'll just stick to what we do best, um, which is um, search, which is video, which is advertising, which is um, infrastructure, computing. Um, that will be probably the business for the next three to five years down. For the next 10 years, 15 years, I have no idea. Yeah. To be honest. <laughs> but my, I mean, there's so, um, the thing is that, and that's why I like working at Google. Um, to be honest, like, well, I'm just three years, so i just three years with Google, not seven years with Jens. Uh, but I'm still really excited with, like, how the company evolves. Because they're, they're taking so many problems and so many issues, like, really broad issues. And everybody is convinced that with the help of technology and smart people, you, you can solve some of those issues. Um, if it will be us who is then essentially like making money out of this, I don't know. Um, but the idea that somebody is willing to invest in this and trying to solve stuff with technology is very, very fascinating and very, very, um, and a very, very exciting thing uh, to be part of. 